doing it is not true at all whatsoever, right? So, uh, just interesting when we look at it. But my point being is this, is that we celebrate in that passage, which we get closer to it, you know, it says, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. And if you really understand what that means, what is being said there, it's like, what it is saying is that God is bringing peace to those who want to receive it. To those who will take, I love it when it's sunny outside and rainy. Right? It's like, beautiful. So Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I gotta take care of a couple things here real quick before we get right into the service. Just keep you guys updated on a few things. It is very important that we as a nation of people in Belize, that we who love Jesus Christ, continue to support Jesus Christ, that we continue to speak of the good things of Jesus Christ throughout. Update on the Israeli thing. It is an assault. What is taking place globally? With the, I'm just keeping you updated for this, just so that you know, because the media is not going to tell you this stuff. So, there is an agenda to make God's people, and here's what you need to understand. It cracks me up when Christians take the sides in these situations outside of God. Now, are there bad people in Israel? Yep. There are bad people here. Dude, I'm a bad person standing up here. If it wasn't by the grace of God and by the shedding blood of Jesus Christ, I wouldn't stand up here. Right? I mean, that's what we have to do. We have to look at it. Here it is. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you realize that you're not adopted into Christianity. Christianity doesn't exist. It's a name. You were a wild branch in Romans, it says, an offshoot that was cut off and grafted into the body of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was a Jew. And Jesus Christ is the only religion in the world. Because he took Judaism and he fulfilled it all. The Old Testament doesn't go away. He fulfilled it. And the promise of our salvation, we were grafted into this. So when we as believers are against what Israel is doing. I'm not saying the corruption, but in a point where their people are trying, they're trying to annihilate, it's genocide. You realize if you support that, you're that child that wants your whole family to be dead. It's, I know it's harsh, I know it's harsh because it goes against everything we're being taught. Everything is being said on the media. Everything of all that. Listen to this. The Bible, God is not going to change the Bible for this generation. He's not going to change it for the baby boomers. He didn't. He's not going to change it, nor did he for Gen X, Gen whatever, millennials or anything. God doesn't change it because it hurts your feelings. The truth is the truth. And the truth is in the word. And guys, I'm going to tell you right now, I was watching the news and reading reports and watching the news and how conflicting they are. Do you realize that right before the ceasefire, the ceasefire, the ceasefire was still on. There was a truce between Palestine and Israel for hostage release. Now, if you hear what the hostages are saying, what they endured, it is frightening. I'm going to tell you, this is not a people group or an army fighting an army. No army in America, we do not take hostages. We do not take women and children and hold them as bargaining pieces. Nor does Belize, nor does Israel. They took children. They take children and do that. She runs the house, right? So what happened was they got these things, they got their days to be able to do it. They extended it. Israel extended it. Israel is now going to go, they're going to restart it back up. It's a truce on both sides. But while the truce is in place, see, all the headline says 200 Palestinians, civilians killed by airstrikes and troop movement. But what you don't know is this. 
is that first and foremost, four hours before the truce was to end, Hamas did a terrorist attack in the city of Jerusalem and killed a people, and they started firing rocks into neighborhood, rockets into neighborhoods four hours before. They instigated it. The news won't tell you that. The news just tells us, oh, 200 were killed on the Palestinian side. Here's what they won't tell you either. Six hours before they bombed those neighborhoods, Israel flew and dropped t- pamphlets saying, in six hours, we are going to bomb this area. The media will never tell you that, right? But they will vilify Israel. They will vilify Israel. Guys, this is a foreshadowing of what the media is going to do to you and I as followers of Jesus. We will be vilified. So absolutely. I'm going to tell you right now, most of you don't know this. You know there's a Catholic priest in prison in Nicaragua for 26 years? You know what he did? Where's the outrage of this? You know what he did? He spoke against the government in Nicaragua. They told him they were going to deport him to America. He refused. He said, my call is here. This is where God's called me. This is where the Catholic Church has placed me. That government took him, and he's in prison for 26 years. Now, here's the deal. The reason why I say that is, where's the outrage? Where's the call for this unjust? I'll tell you why. Because he falls into this religious circle that the world is starting to turn against. It prepares us for it. God is preparing us for those things that are going to come. And so keep your support. Keep your voice active. You don't have to be, you know, I don't need to wave the Israeli flag and be up, but you need to be praying and you need to understand when people are talking and giving you word salad, you need to know the truth. The truth is, this is people that want to kill every Jew. And when they come after, when they're done with that, they're coming after you and I. Just do a study of Islam. Even when I talk to Islam guys here, they don't really know what they believe. It's like the cults. Most people don't know what the cults, they only know key things. Did you know there's, there's three types of people in the world, according to Islam? Did you know that? It's taught in the, in the Quran. There's three types of people. There's Islam. Right? There's infidels, which is you and I, Christians, anyone who is not a follower of Islam. And the third? Jews. And Jews are less than people. That's what they believe. So, (laughs) I'm telling you guys, people don't know this. You got to know the enemy. And this is what's being taught by the enemy. And most, when I tell it to people, they go, no, it's not true. I go, man, you need to dig deep, baby. You need to dig deep and understand what you are promoting. It's not some cool hipster thing. This is, it's life and death. And it's a part of hatred. Like pure, utter hatred towards mankind. And that. And so we're seeing those type of things. We need to have a strong voice. Why do I open with that today? Christmas time. I open with it because Jesus started this whole mess. And Jesus will finish it, and that's hope for you and I. We celebrate the fact that he came here. He saw that it was messy, and he saw that it was getting messier and messier, and he saw that we kept turning our eyes away from him more and more and more. And before the foundation of the earth, God and Jesus, the Holy Ghost, had the perfect family taking place in heaven. They invited us into it by creating us, and then they knew that we were going to mess up, and we did. And they still decided to keep us coming and invited us into this family because they are the inventors of love. They are love. And so then they come up with the game plan, game plan Jesus. If I was writing Operation, it would be Operation Save the World, right? Op, save the world. What was it? We will insert. We will counter. It's counterinsurgency. Jesus was counterinsurgency into this world. And for all who believe in him, from a child to that suffering and raising, going through everything that we go through. Jesus has experienced, even in our hard times, Jesus has experienced worse than we'll ever. He was a refugee. How many here in the room has ever been a refugee? Anyone? 
Have you ever been, has anyone here been to a refugee, a refugee camp? I have. Don't want to live there. Jesus was a refugee. Jesus was hunted down to be killed. He was poor, right? He grew up working hard. Dad was a carpenter, probably not with wood, probably with stone, so it's even harder. Jesus was a stud, man. Jesus grew up and became a man. People hated him. And then he died on the cross willingly for you and I because that was the plan. And it started with his birth. The plan was long before, but started with birth. We celebrate the gift of Jesus. What is that gift? That, gi- that gift, if you're sitting here with me and you're in here today, that gift is salvation. It is, and it's deeper than salvation. It is a relationship with God for eternity. It is so much deeper that it is deep. It removes your guilt and your shame. Has anyone in the room ever felt like you just are burdened by shame? Or guilt? Have you ever had that? You just you, you make mistake after mistake, and it just keeps piling in. You're just you're you're just guilted out. You just feel shameful. You don't even want to come to church sometimes because you just feel so shameful. Did you know that we come to gather in a place like this not to have shame heaped on us, but to remember that Jesus Christ took our shame. That in my failures, all I have to do is say, "Man, I'm so sorry, God. I, I did it again." I did it again. I, I make promises with God all the time. I tell God I'm not going to hate people all the time. I'm not going to hate. I'm just going to love. I'm going to love. And then I see somebody do horrific things to other people. And I go, I hate them. I just hate them. Lord, give me righteous hatred. <laughs> and then I have to go, oh, I'm going to preach. He came to remove that. That's what we celebrate Christmas morning is the gift that you're not under the bondage of shame and guilt. Some of you have been hurt by church. Some of you have been hurt by religion. Jesus didn't hurt you. He did not hurt you. He loves you. Some dorkwad fool that's a human being just like you made mistakes. And he hurt you. But it was never God's plan. And he wants to gather you together and they made you feel less than who you are. Made you feel, some of you may feel like you have no gifts and nothing to offer. That's not true. God brings it to you. And when you come here, that's, that's Jesus. That's Christmas. As he takes that and says, no, you're unique in you. And your gift is just for you. There may be others that have a gift similar to yours or the same type of gift. But your gift can only be used by you because I gave it to you and you alone. You're not worthless. That's Christmas morning. So you made a few mistakes. I died for those mistakes. That's Christmas morning. It's so much deeper. All the pain and the heartache in the world. Like even, you know, you go like, man, how do we do this? It's talking to Woody. It's like, man, we've got to raise our kids. Like, you gotta, when you have kids and my daughters have to raise their kids... There is an assault on them. And it's frightening. And I look around the world and I go, my God, are we winning? Even this week with some of the stuff that God calls us to do, man, I went through moments of just utter depression, just utter failure. And then he is the lifter of my chin. That's Christmas morning when we're just heartbroken that we can't rescue for whatever reason. And I just pound, we beat ourselves up. And then he just lifts our chin and says, nope. Nope. Stay in the fight. That's Christmas morning. That this world is bearing down on you and I. But Jesus is the final word. And his final word is eternity at his table where there's no more tears, no more guilt or shame because of what he did 
and he came to do and he promised to do Christmas morning. That's the season we celebrate. Celebrate it every day, guys. Don't lose the awe of the Christmas tree, even if there's not much. Go chop one down. Put it in your house. Do something. Don't lose the awe of this. Put the lights up, the festival of lights. There's symbolic stuff. You can listen to all those goofy people that talk about Christmas trees and lights. They're all a bunch of hogwashing people. Right, listen, I'm going to set up that big old Christmas tree, put lights all around, the ornaments can go on, the kids can come home and stuff presents under it. But I can guarantee you this is not what I do every day. But some of these Christians, even some of my friends say, I can't believe you have that piece of idolatry in your house, man. You got like a symbol of word. I go, look, man, you guys are morons. But you continue to do what you do, you lemon-sucking dudes. Because what I'm tell you what happens. I look at the tree every day, and I look at the beauty of the tree, and I know, what's gonna, I know what it represents. I know that in just a few short weeks, there's going to be my family there, and we're going to be laughing and opening presents, and there's going to be joy, and it's just going to be, it's going to be beautiful chaos. Wrapping paper, and I'll be all uptight, like, put it in the bag. Put it in the bag. Put it in the trash in the bag. I mean, I just get, like, the older I get, I don't know, man. I'm like, hey. But I can guarantee you what I don't do. I don't get up every morning and go, oh, holy Christmas tree. I worship you. My God, these people are morons, man. Spend more time in the Bible. You don't have time to worry about other people's joy because of your lack of it. God will give. Listen, if you struggle with joy, ask for it. You don't have to worry about my joy. He'll give you your own if you ask. Amen? Man, that's what I'm talking about. Big A, tell me, how'd it go? Grab a mic and come up here real quick before we get in the Word. Come on up here. Tell me about last night. You look all sleepy and tired. Come up here. Grab a mic. We've got to hear something, man. Some youth event went on last night, right? I also found out today. I know, listen, we have such a great team here of all of you really are all part of Kavod, but I even found, no, oh, Mike up here. I, I even found out today by friends that I sponsor a volleyball team. I'm trying to figure out how in the heck I sponsor a volleyball team. Like, he's like, hey, you sponsor a volleyball team. I'm like, I don't know, I do? <laughs> yeah, Lisa's back there, she knows. No one bothers to tell me anything. You know why? Because I'm getting to that age right now that I go, all right, let's evaluate the complexity of the giving of this money to this boss. They just go, hey, dad's good with it, man. Dad's good with it. Just roll with it. Tell me about this weekend. Tell me about yes, last night. I don't really know what to say. Um, you know. um, everything gone amazing. It was a great night. Um, uh, some different people uh, got some healing for some different stuff and got released from a lot of things that they were battling with. Um, at the end, we had an altar call, which was um, about half the people that were there. So, so it good. was really good. Um, yeah. So people were set free. Yes. Got some deliverance going on last night. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. What did you do? Uh, I'll bring another phone shot right now. You're, the, <laughs> you're the youth guy. You know what youth guys are? I'm going to tell you what. The, I did youth. For a lot of years, even here, you know that, right? All those years, I had hundreds and hundreds of kids here at one time. Here's all that a youth guy does. I mean, he does so much more. He's given Jesus. But all they do, it's like herding cats. That's what it is. All the young people around here, it's like trying to herd cats. Because they're all like this. And you're just like trying to keep going. Jesus loves you. That's a stupid decision. Right? You feel like that, right? That's a dumb idea. The two of you walking off in the dark is a dumb idea. Like, you know, right? If you've worked in youth, that's how it is, baby. So it was good. Yes. Any, any, anything stand out, one story stand out? Um, there was a girl that Woody was, <laughs> uh, Woody was praying over, um, and um, she was, like, battling a lot of stuff that I just think, like, we kind of overlook, and it's become, like, a normal in Belize for like kids to be dealing with high level of stress and high level of this in, in their home. And she, as Woody just prayed over her, she just kind of like broke down and just stood, like she just stood there. Like she just stood there and we could just see kind of like everything just, you know, the Lord just releasing that stuff from her. And after I got to speak 
with her a little bit and she just said that she just felt like just weight being lifted off of her. So that was a cool testimony. Praise you, Jesus, man. Let's pray. I want to stay right here. Gracious Father, I thank you for Erickson. I thank you for his heart for the youth of this country. I thank you that we're grateful that you have him here and we're grateful to hear a bondage being released, that people have been set free, Lord. And so I thank you for last night. I pray that you, Holy Ghost, continue to whisper and speak and shake the lives of those individuals. And all those who worked it, Lord, bless them. Just bless them. Bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. Hey, we're in Judges, rolling into end of chapter 8, going into 9. We've got to hit a couple things. This is where I said last week that this story of Gideon's a great story, but it, the next chapter, two chapters, isn't great. It's a warning. And we need to start out this part by going with me. Turn with me to um, Proverbs chapter 29. Okay? And then we're going to talk a little bit about this Abelamic fella. And we're going to talk about what happens when we take our eyes off of God, off of Jesus Christ. It doesn't turn out well. So, Proverbs 29 says this. For people who hate discipline and only get more stubborn, there'll come a day when life tumbles in and they break. But by then, it will be too late to help them. When good people run things, everyone is glad. But when a ruler is bad, everyone groans. If you love wisdom, you'll delight your parents, but you'll destroy their trust if you run with prostitutes. Okay? Goes deeper, the prostitutes goes deeper. There's a deeper meaning with that. It's also those who have prostituted themselves to foreign gods. Okay? There's deep, deep here. A leader of good judgment gives stability. An exploiting leader leaves a trail of waste. A flattering neighbor is up to no good. He's probably planning to take advantage of you. Evil people fall into their own traps. Good people run the other way, glad to escape. The good-hearted understand what it's like to be poor. The hard-hearted haven't the faintest idea. A gang of cynics can upset a whole city. A group of sages can calm everyone down. A sage trying to work things out with a fool gets only scorn and sarcasm for his trouble. Murderers hate honest people. Uh, Moral folks encourage them. A fool gets it all hung out. A sage quietly mulls it over, lets it all hang out. When a leader listens to malicious gossip, all the workers get infected with evil. This is very important. The poor and their abusers at least have something in common. They can both see their sight is God's gift. Leadership gains authority and respect when the voiceless poor are treated fairly. Wise discipline imparts wisdom. Spoiled adolescents embarrass their parents. When degenerates take charge, crime runs wild, but the righteous will eventually observe their collapse. Discipline your children. You'll be glad you did. They'll turn out delightful to live with. It's a true statement, man. Whip them when they're young. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what He reveals, they are most blessed. It takes more than talk to keep workers in line. Mere words go in one ear and out the other. Observe the people who always talk before they think. Even simpletons are better off than they are. That goes along with that Chinese proverb, right? It's better be thought that you're a fool than to open your mouth and prove it. That's what it's saying right there. You let people treat you like a doormat, you'll be quite forgotten in the end. Angry people stir up a lot of discord. The intemperate stir up trouble. Pride lands you flat on your face. Humility prepares you for honors. Befriend an outlaw and become an enemy to yourself. When the victims cry out, you'll be included in their curses if you're a coward to their cause in court. You know what that means? 
when you see something that's evil, you need to speak out against it. Because you're, you're not, oh, I'm not standing in a court. No, you're in the court of public opinion. And Hebrews chapters 11 tells us that there is a great cloud of witnesses watching everything that we do. And if we tolerate evil, hmm. the fear of whom human opinion disables trusting in God or per- disables you. Trusting in God protects you from that. Everyone tries to help from everyone tries to get help from the leader, but only God will give us justice. Only Yahweh. Good people can't stand the sight of deliberate evil. The wicked can't stand the sight of well chosen goodness. They're envious of it. There's so much to it, even in ministry, there's so much to that. It's a constant check and balance of heart. You see good things happening in other churches and you're bitter for it. Something's wrong, and you're the wrong. True statement. But it leads us to this 29, I mean to chapter 9, all right? Abimelech, Abimelech. This cat, people will you know, scroll through it so fast, and they think that he was a judge. He wasn't a judge. He was a tyrant. He is the son of Gideon. He watched Gideon do it. His name means this. It's very important as we tell the story. It's very important that we understand what his name means. Because his name means my father is king. That's what, that's what uh, Abimelech means. My father is king. There's three other people of high, high... It's a common name in Israel, right? It's a common name. But there was three kings that were named this, high people of authority. But we have to understand what it means. So it says, like Ab is where we get Father, Abba, Ab, how you spell this in Hebrew. And so you have this, my father is King, Melech. Okay, so you have this. Now watch. This term that it's used in here is my father is King. It doesn't necessarily, it's not a biological thing. It's a social meaning. And it create and it is, hey, my father is king, that what his name means is in a social situation, he's one of the alpha males because my father's king. It's not a biological Abraham Isaac where he laid his hand on his thigh and passed that blessing on to him. He gave him a name that means my father is king. And I wrote this in here. This is a warning to us. Because the other kings, they're good guys. They do the right thing. They're good dudes, okay? But they use that name that they have as a reflection of who God really is, Abba. Here, the warning is this, and I wrote this. Just using this title to build ourselves up to rule others in an ungodly way. You and I have the propensity of using God for our own power and to rule how we see to rule. But we use God to do the rule. It's what he, it's what he did. He used it as, as a social, not a biological tense. He did it to, um, to assert an alpha role, like I said. This guy, Ambelic, He has this desire to be a ruler, a king, because he saw what his dad did. Go back and read the story. He's not a king, and he's not a ruler of a king. And sometimes, if you're not raised right, and there's there's stuff in here. He is one of of 70 children that Gideon fathered. Listen to me. And he is one of 70 children that Gideon fathered. Cultures, <laughs> that's their culture, it's the way they do it, so it's okay for today. No, it wasn't okay then because it creates problems, and it's not okay now. God said you were to be, he's not ever going to take away your free will. You are to be married to one woman if you're a guy, and if you're a woman, to one guy. And you're to be married and faithful to them. 
and bear your kids and do what you need to do and be faithful to each other. Here is set, he has 69 brothers and sisters, or 69 brothers, I think, all right? Now check this out. He, his mother is a concubine, not Gideon's wife. She's one of the workers, slave. There's problems when you start to dissect the story. God used him in a powerful way because God is God and God used to free a whole group of people. But it doesn't mean because God uses me to free a whole group of people. It doesn't matter if there's like, like I, it's hard for me to go anywhere in this country and have someone not know me. It really is. It's hard. It's getting harder and harder. It's getting harder to go into Guatemala and Mexico and not run into people that know me. And so I could have 2,000 BDF soldiers that call me pastor. And this awesome group right here at Boneville with Cabode that call me pastor. None of that makes me right in the eyes of God. None of it. This could be the most successful. Th- there could be 5,000 people in here. None of this makes me right. But God can use me to affect you through his truth of word. But he's going to deal with me. Do you see what you track what I'm saying? He's not going to be thwarted. It doesn't. What makes me right with him is Jesus Christ and the shedding blood of Christ and me on a daily basis going, God, what am I doing? God, I need your help. I need to be in an everyday conversation with him. Like, what are we doing here? What does this mean? How do we, ah, Lord, it's chaos. It's foggy. I can't see through the fog. Well, I don't need you to see through the fog right now. I'm protecting you with the fog. No, I need to see. No, shut up and play a video game. Today, you just need to not see anything. And then I have to trust him and say, yeah, you're right. There's so much I should be doing, but it's not clear on what. But what I do know is sitting here in my chair is a good thing. Now, doing that every day is not a good thing. But there are times that God does that. What's he doing? He's protecting me, and I have to trust him in the protection. That comes through this daily walk that keeps you right. But like this, Gideon, there was some shambles going on. And there was shambles going on in the whole people group. That's why the the Midianites had them conquered. There's a picture of this here. The dude is like on a power trip. He's like one of those power trip pastors. They drive me. It's trippy to me. Because they do, they put these unrealistic rules on people. Jesus came to break all that. Say, it's your will. It's your will. It's your will. Do with it what you want but know there's consequences to the choices you make. Now I'm here for you and I love you and I'll help you fix it. I said to a politician one time, we were talking to a politician, and they're making some stupid decisions, stupid decisions. And I said, hey, will you at least give me a heads up? Give me a couple days heads up. He's like, what? Before you pass something stupid. He's like, oh. I said, so it gives us a couple days head start to pray and ask God how to reverse the stupid decision you're going to make. They don't like it when you talk to them like that. And then you got to do it with a smile, tell them you love them. <laughs> love you, brother. They're probably watching right now. That's what he's doing. That's inside information, man. It's inside. I'm getting intel. What they don't know is we're praying about. We want to know what they did so we can pray about it so we can insert Jesus into them. You know what Jesus' desire, though, in the whole situation is to have them look good. He loves them, and he wants success, but it's got to be his success. Does that make sense? Like, he wants people. I know it's hard. If you're a a red person and not blue, you're like, ah, ah. If you're blue, you're like, that's right. God's hand is on. If you're a Trumper, Trump, yes. You hate Biden. Oh, the devil. What God is saying is, look, I, I love everyone, but not everyone loves me. If you continue to curse me, I'll let the curses reverse to you. But if you continue to look to me, I'll give you rest. And I'll give you peace in the midst of struggles. Abimelech doesn't do that. Gideon was hardly cool. That's why I love this version. He was hardly cool in the tomb when the people of Israel had gotten off track 
and were prostituting themselves to Baal. They made Baal, uh, Baal of the covenant, their God. The people of Israel forgot all about God, their God, who had saved them from their enemies, who had hemmed them in, and they didn't keep faith with the family of Gideon, honoring all the good that he had done for Israel. They, as soon as he's dead, they just kind of turn their back on him. All right, we can go do what we want because this governing dude that protected us is dead. Now we can take care of ourselves. Forget all about God. He says, man, the, the author here, the Holy Spirit says he wasn't even cool in the tomb. That dude is like not days dead, man. <laughs> that dude is like, I look at that and go, how many times have I done that, though? How many times have I been to church, hear a great message, or have an experience, not even in church, I just have this great moment. God has delivered me from something. I do something, and within a day, I'm, I push the stupid button. It just floats by, and I go, I can't help it. It's so beautiful. And Belak, son of, of Gideon, went to Shechem to his uncles and all his mother's relatives and said to them, ask all the leading men of Shechem what do you think is best, that 70 men rule you? All right, 70 of these ancestors. Now, you got to see what's going on here. These are his brothers. These are his relatives. And he goes in. There's deceit here. There's deception taking place. you got to look. Remember the story within the story. you got to see you in the story. Have you ever done anything like this? So he goes in to stir it up, and he says, he asks them, what do you think is best, that 70 men rule you, all the sons of, of Jeroboam or Gideon, or the one man rule? You'll remember that I am your own flesh and blood. Now, this, you have to ask yourself this question, okay? In this, what is he doing right now? There is pictures in here that we can do a reflection on our life to see where we're at. The question and how he's posing the questions where have we heard that before in the Bible? You guys know? Maybe in the garden? Did he say you'd truly die? Why is he afraid? Isn't it better that you rule you? Why do you need God to rule you? What? Is there a reason why? Is, do you, it, hey, Eve, maybe he doesn't want you to be as smart as him. We've heard this before. You can look at your own life and you can tell when someone's bamboozling you too. If you just keep your face in the Bible and read the stories, don't read it fast. Read it and say, man, where do I fit in this? Because when you read that, it is evidently clear of what he's doing. And I go, man, the moment I read that, I go, that's what Satan did to Eve in the garden. He just changed words up right here because Satan can't change his colors. He is who he is. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. What's he trying to do? He wants to kill and he wants to destroy, and he wants to steal the glory of God that Gideon fought for. You'll see that. He came to kill, steal, and destroy, and he's using it. His mother's relatives reported the proposal of the leaders to Shechem. They were inclined to take um, Abimelech because they said, he is, after all, one of us. Well, he's one of ours. Just because he's one of yours doesn't mean he's the best one. Remember last week? Vote the man, not the party. If the dude's a dork, don't vote for him, even if he's blue or red. Don't vote for him. Vote for the better person. Well, he's blue. So you're going to elect a crook? A freaking, it's going to take all your money? And you think the party's going to do anything about it for you? You're crazy. They gave him 70 silver pieces from the shrine of Baal of the Covenant. 70 pieces. Huh. Start, there's numbers are very important in the Bible. Right? It's a piece of silver from every guy. It's crazy. Right? It just goes, anyhow. You, get, you guys can play with the stories. You can see how it's doubled and pre. It, it's, fun. it's fun if you do it. Just ask God to help you do it. With the money, he hired some reckless riffraff soldiers, mercenaries. Guys that all they do like gangbangers. All they do is set up ambushes and steal people and rob people. So he goes out and he goes to these goose. Now, let me tell you something. I know dudes that I need to call if I need help. I really don't know the bad guys to call. I know there's bad guys out there, but I don't put myself in the company of bad guys. I put myself in the company of good guys. So therefore, I don't... To, see the story in the story here? 
Gideon's son is hanging out with bad dudes because he knows them. It's not like he had to send an emissary and try to find them. He goes directly to him with the money. Hey, fellas, you want to make some money quick? You see that, those people up in the little side note here in Rabbit Trail? This is funny. Store got robbed last night in Belmont. Two motorcycles ride up. Four guys, two are masked. One has a shotgun, the other guy has a pistol. Two don't have masks on. They pull up. A guy standing outside the store in Belmont Pond sees him pull up with the guns going and start robbing the store. He goes and he only has time to grab one of the keys out of the motorcycle. Now that guy, I want to buy that guy dinner. I'm going to find out who he is. I'm seriously going to buy him dinner. I'm going to find out who he is. I'm going to buy him dinner. That dude had the balls and the courage to walk up in the middle of an armed robbery and think and snatches the key out of the motorcycle. The guys come running out with their loot. <laughs> Two guys can't get their money. They have to run off in the bushes. And because they ran off, the video cameras got pictures of them. I'm like, that dude's a hero. I'll protect you, brother. I'll protect you. We need more men like that. We need more men like that. Golly, I love it. I'm like, criminals are idiots, man. There's a reason why you leave a getaway driver driving. <laughs> what would have been more funny is if two thieves saw them go in and stole their bikes. That would have been more funny. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. So honestly, the devil, when you make a deal with the devil, he doesn't like you. And the devil is laughing at them. He's laughing. One guy's trust is hurt and lost a bunch of stuff. Fear in the community. And he's not laughing at that, but he's also laughing at how stupid the guys were. They were <laughs> they're going to go to prison, those dummies. Now, I'm going to stick on the side of Jesus, man. If, you know what I'm saying? So he gets the silver pieces with the money he gets these guys. They go up to, now listen, they go. They went up to um, Opira and killed his half-brothers. Killed them all. He went up and killed every one of his family members. Anyone who's a threat to be a king, except for one. The youngest, Jotham, son of Jeroboam, of Gideon, actual son, managed to hide, managed to get away. Then all the leaders of Shechem, Beth Milo, gathered at the oak by the standing stone at Shechem and crowned Embelech. This is important because they already had an oak tree that they did seances and crap under. Some magical tree. And then this is where this supposed man of God is going to be crowned. Under some magical, mystical tree. Brother, I'm going to tell you this. There was a magical, mystical tree. And it was called the cross. And it was not this tree. It was the tree that Jesus knew he would hang on. And the power of that cross, that instrument, that power of that didn't make him king. He was already king. You see what I'm saying? When all this was told to Jotham, he climbed up to the top of Mount Gerizim, raised his voice and shouted. So here's the son. This is the true son of Gideon. He's got his father in him. Everyone's turned. He just witnessed his, all of his brothers massacred by his own brother. It was bloodshed, man. Bloodshed. It's not pretty. And at, at this mount, there's this like triangled outcropping of rocks. It's like the perfect, like, the lion. What is that movie? The Disney? The Lion King, you know? Ah, you know, he holds up the light. It's like that. It's this big outcropping. And he goes up on it. It's a big platform. And he can talk from up there down to all the people. And this is what he says. He, he raised his voice and he shouted, Listen to me, leaders of Shechem. And let God listen to you. Boy, those are fighting words right there. And he just... <laughs> He basically said to them, you leaders are not my leader, and God is my leader. You talk to God. And he says this, you better, and let God listen to you. God won't. He'll turn his ears from you. 
The trees set out one day to anoint a king for themselves. He gives this riddle. And this is very important because these people and the trees that are mentioned here are of high value and respected trees in biblical days and to these people. There's an importance here. So he says this. <clears throat> so it, to a, he says, The tree set out one day to a, uh, anoint a king for themselves. They said to, to the olive tree, Rule over us. But the olive tree told them, I am no longer good for making oil. That gives glory to gods and men and to be demoted to waving over trees. Whoa. Not over here. What I produce is that which brings glory to God. This is what the olive tree says. I'm not going to wave over you and give you shade. The trees then said to the fig tree, you come and rule over us. But big, but big fig tree said to them, am I no longer good for making sweets, my mouth watering sweet fruits, and to be demoted to waving over trees? Is that what you want? Are you saying that what I produce? Is that what you're saying? Uh uh I will not be demoted to wave over you because I was created for something greater. Watch this. The tree said to the vine, you come and rule over us. But the vine said to them, I am, no, am I no longer good for making wine, wine that cheers gods and men, and be demoted to waving over trees? All the trees said, then said to tumbleweed, ooh, You come over and reign over us. But Tumbleweed said to the trees, If you're serious about making me your king, come and find shelter in my shade. Tumbleweeds don't give shade. They're thorny. But if not, let fire shoot from Tumbleweed and burn down the cedars of Lebanon. Doosh. This kid is a friggin' genius. Through Gideon's faults and many failures, he loved God. He raised this young man in his home to understand and have wisdom. And this kid goes up there and he shouts it out and then he says this, Now listen, do you think you did a right and honorable thing when you made Abimelech king? Do you think you treated Gideon and his family well? Did for him what he deserved? My father fought for you, risked his own life, and rescued you from Midian's tyranny, and you have just now betrayed him. You massacred his sons, 70 men on a single stone. They publicly took them out in front of everybody on a large slaughtering stone and beheaded them in front of everybody. And the crowds, yay! Sounds a lot like uh, what took place a couple thousand years ago. Give us Barabbas! You massacred his sons. You made Abelic the son by his maidservant, king over Shechem's leaders, because he's your relative. If you think that this is an honest day's work, this way you have treated... Gideon today, then enjoy Abimelech and let him enjoy you. But if not, let fire break from Abimelech and turn Abimelech and burn up the, the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo and let fire break from the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo and burn up Abimelech. And then Jotham fled. He ran for his life. He went to Bear and settled down there because he was afraid of his brother. Here's what he was basically saying. Man, he was profound. He's saying, man, you guys are fools in modern day language. You're fools. I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to turn on him and he's going to turn on you. And the fires of you, what feared the farmers in this region the most was that tumbleweeds. And here's why. Because when a tumbleweed catches fire, it, it's like, uh, it'd be like lighting a, a forest on fire, right? You can't stop it because tumbleweeds are dead, dry, and they got thorns all on them, and they roll. So when they, the heat, when a fire is burning in tumbleweeds, where I grew up in Southern California, we have tumbleweeds. And when tumbleweeds catch fire, they're dangerous because fire creates its own wind, and it pushes rolling balls of fire everywhere. 
And so it's not like you can just go stomp it out. You got one that's blowing over that way. You got one that's blowing, and it's catching everything on fire. And it burns down the trees that give you life. Remember the trees that spoke? He gives the thing. He's a, you're going to burn them all down. Everything that you give life from your shade, from your wine, from your food to the oil, you're burning down life. That's what you guys have elected. You're fools and he boogies. He leaves. This is that story where I'm saying, man, it doesn't turn out well. He goes on, and I'm going to go fast. He says that he ruled over Israel for three years. Oh, it's not very long. He doesn't rule very long. Then God brought bad blood between Ambelic and Shechem's leaders. Prophetic. Prophetic. There's a way that we look at this Jotham and go, man, this kid was prophetic, man. He had something in him. Holy Ghost is working in him. He's got the courage. He got courage. He ain't afraid, even though he watched you and you know he wants to, you wanted to butcher him. And he speaks truth and wisdom of his father. Ooh, there's pictures and pictures here. You guys know where I'm going here? <laughs> Who was hunted down and tried to be killed as a child? Jesus. There is these little pictures all throughout scriptures that point to Jesus and the one voice of truth that shows up and tells the world what's going to happen. Dude, there's a picture of the end of days here. How long does he rule? Three years. Revelation, the great tribulation, three and a half years. <laughs> there's these pictures that you don't make denominational views over, but you look at it, you go, oh, I've read that. Oh, my gosh, I've read Oh, Oh, he's a type of Antichrist. He's a type of Antichrist. God's trying to show us that. In Judges, there is good people that I will win. But you better be careful. You better watch what they say and know the tones tones of the questions that they ask. Right? Lisa will tell you this. My kids will tell you. I know I drive my kids and close friends crazy sometimes because they'll come to me and go, hey, have you met this person? And I'll go, yeah, I have. We'll do nothing with them. Oh, you mean? Well, we won't do anything. I like them. You can like them all day long. They ain't, I ain't doing nothing with them. Whoa, whoa. Years later, oh, God, so glad we didn't do anything with them. Why? Here's why. Guys, I am not the most gifted person in the world, so what I have to do is continually be in here to understand and try to figure stuff out. So when I'm talking to somebody, questions are being thrown at me, I'm trying to figure out, I've heard that before, and I've heard it in that, whoa, 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 wait a minute, and in my mind, red flags, do, 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 it's not because I have this great wisdom, I'm just smart enough, just smart enough to stay right here and say, God, I need your help, so the wisdom that you do give me, and the knowledge that you do give me. Let me understand what's happening around me so I don't get bamboozled. You see what I'm saying? This dude's got three years. It's in here. I go, oh my gosh, Lord, this is craziness. He brought this bad bad blood. (laughs) You think I'm kidding? Read the story. Read Revelation. Read how it all kind of takes place in Ezekiel. You kind of go, oh. God's like, hey, uh, it's my, it's your joy to figure out my riddles. I love you, son. Now figure out my riddles. Because my book is filled with them. And when you see him, you suddenly go, yep, I'm sticking with you. I'm staying with God. Nope, I ain't going nowhere else, man. There, you, you can't make this up. You cannot make up this stuff. Watch this. The murderous violence that killed the 70 brothers, the sons of Gideon, was now loose among Abimelech and Shechem's leaders who had supported the violence. The 70 dudes they hired, guess what they're doing? They're running wild now on, the very, on them. That stone, that remember the Proverbs talks about rolling a stone? Be careful, you roll a stone on somebody to crush them, that stone's going to roll back on you, brother. Now I watched a movie last night that I thought was awesome. Now you might not think it was awesome, but I thought it was awesome, it was funny, there was some bad language in it, but I started laughing at it because the story's called, it's, it's Violent Night is the name. It's a Christmas movie, but it's a violent Christmas movie. And basically what happens is Santa's delivering presents, 
and a bunch of murdering thieves show up to steal all this money, but Santa gets locked in the house because his reindeer leave with the sled, and he's stuck in the house. Well, then they started fighting Santa. And it pissed Santa off. And then it gives this backstory of Santa, because, you know, if you know the stories of Santa, where he comes from, at one time they believe he was a, a warrior, like a, like a, a, a hammer of God warrior. Where he carried a hammer. That's where they believe. And he rescued, tra- he used to rescue kids, traffic children. That was Santa Claus. That's why he brings presents to kids. Anyhow. So the story is, these dudes all come in well-armed. They're Santa in his fat suit. There he is, and he beats, the, he beats them all. Now, he gets hurt, wounded, it, but he beats them all. I'm like, that's Proverbs right there. There is not a movie made. Everyone thinks they're so clever. That is the Proverbs right there. That is a bunch of dudes trying to roll a stone down on somebody, and the stone got reversed and rolled over to them. And Santa did it! Yay! And at the end, it was a Christmas, you know. If you believe, I'm thinking, that's Chris, that's Ah, it's biblical too. If you believe, he'll come back to life. Think about this, guys. Not Santa, but if you believe, you'll come to life. It's all right here. These guys live in. So now they've all turned on him. They're killing him. To undermine uh, Abimelech, Shechem's leaders put men in ambush on the mountain passes who robbed travelers on the roads. And then Bel- was told. So now they're, compl- they're, it's this mess. I'm not going to let you guys read through it. So it goes through this whole mess. They go through, they take over a city. Then there's some dude that thinks he's a bad dude and he's not a bad dude. He's a coward and he gets a hand to him. And it goes through this whole story and then it comes over to this. <clears throat> it comes down. They're fighting, jumping down to 42. The next day, the people went to the fields. This was reported to Embelic. He took his troops, divided them into three companies, and placed them in ambush in the fields. When he saw the people were well out of the open, he sprang up and attacked them. Abimelech and the company with him charged ahead to control the entrance of the city gate. Okay? The other two companies chased down those who were in the open fields and killed them. Uh, Abimelech fought at the city all that day. He captured the city and massacred everyone in it. Dude, is a this dude is not a child of God. He's just killing people to kill people. He's, he's what we call bloodthirsty. He's thirsty for violence. It's what we see in terrorism. They just kill to kill. They kill women and children, old people. They just, you hear the horrific stories. They're, it's demonic. They took the medicine of old people in Israel. They took the medicine from them and watched them die in their wheelchairs. That's cruel. God would never do that to you. Satan would. That's what he is doing. It's cruel. He's killing everyone. When the leaders connected with Shechem's tower heard this, they went in to uh, fortify this big temple. This was reported to Abimelech that the Shechem's tower bunch had gathered together. He and his troops climbed Mount Zalman, the dark mountain. Abimelech took his axe and chopped a bundle of firewood, picked it up, put it on his shoulder, and said to his troops, you have to do the same as me. And they put it all, the tower fortified, set the whole structure on fire. Everyone in Shechem's tower died. A thousand men and women, children. Burned them to death. Jotham, sitting on the rock, said, you will light the fire. This is the Shechem's, the guys that turned on him, that had him, he said, you will light the tumbleweed on fire. Makes you wonder when they were in that tower, if they recalled the words of a prophet, the prophetic word that said, you will light this tumbleweed. You better listen. You better hope God hears you. Wow, this stuff is crazy to me. Sometimes I tear up in my room. I read this stuff and I think, oh, God, I could be Embelic. Embelic. I could be Embelic. I could be him in the right circumstance. God, help my heart. Keep my heart clean and pure, please. I have the propensity to be that. So do you. So Jesus, please, 
Let me not, I know you're never not far from me, but I wander from you all the time. So keep a leash. I shared about that picture, man. That's me. That's my life. I think Jesus still sees that today. I had a vision one time. I asked God what he saw in me. And I saw this vision of a, a little boy. There was a man in the field. It was a, a field where I grew up behind the house. And there was a little boy and there was a man. I couldn't see the man's face, but there was a little boy running around in this field. There was like these little dust devil wind things. And he's running around and I'm, I'm praying like, Lord, how do you, how do you see me? Like, how do you? And then the man picks me up, picks up the child. But when he spins the child around, it's my face on the child and he's hugging me and the Lord said that's how I see you you're just my boy at 56 you're still my son at 30 or 25 you're still his daughter you're still his son and daughter that's how he sees you he doesn't see us old he sees us vibrant youthful the way he created us to be filled with joy and love this is not it Lord I don't want to be that guy I want to be that boy I want to pursue your heart, God. And it's so easy for me to pursue my heart. It's so easy. Ah, man. Let my kids and grandkids have a legacy where they don't be Abimelech. Because they, if I do anything right, may it be that they have faith with you that I have with you. It's my prayer, like, Ah, watch this. Abimelech went on to Tebez. He camped at Tebez and captured it. The tower of strength stood in the middle of the city. All the men and women of the city, along with the city's leaders, had fled there and locked themselves in. They were up in the tower roof. It's a different city now. Now he's just bloodthirsty. He's raving everything now. He's just raging. He's just going to burn it to the ground, man. Scorched earth. Watch this. So funny. It's so funny. Remember, this is very important what I said. What did I say? The name was a social main name, right? Right? His name is a social name. Remember, his name means what? My father is king, but in a social status, it means that he's one of the alphas. He's an alpha dog. He's alpha male. Watch this. Just God's sense of humor is brilliant. So he stands, the tower, the leaders fled there, locked themselves in. They were up in the tower roof. And Belek got as far as the tower and assaulted it. He came up to the tower door to set it on fire. <laughs> Just then some woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and crushed his skull. Some chick's up on the top of the tower. Now remember, he's the alpha dog. Dude, women, man, do not cross women. I'm telling you right now. Do your job as an alpha dog and make sure that she sits on the pedestal and is well fed. Right? And if you're a bad man, stay, don't try to set the door on fire. This chick gets up there. Everyone else is cowering. This woman. I wonder if she spit first to get the direction. Uh, right there. He's down there, flint. I'm gonna get this. whack. Boom, boom. Out go the lights. Watch this. Crushed his skull. So he's still alive, though. He's feeling the torment of what he's doing, and he has enough wherewithal in him that he, uh, as it, I mean, so he's got massive head trauma, but he can see. He may not be seeing clearly, but he can see. He sees good enough laying on the ground to look up, and there's a woman smiling at him from the top of the roof. How you doing there, honey? How you doing, baby? You doing good, honey? Sucker. That's right. He says to the, he calls his, he urgently, this is cowardly. He's a freaking coward. He urgently calls the young armor bearer and said, draw your sword and kill me so they can't say of me, that a woman killed me. He is so prideful in the end of his days when he had a moment to cry out to God, say, God, forgive me for all that I have done. 
I, do not, I can't even make a sacrifice to you. He was so worried about himself. Narcissistic devil. Picture of the Antichrist. He says, kill me. So that they can't say that a woman killed me. Well, guess what, you dumb fool. Everyone on the planet knows a woman killed you, you idiot. And we all, now not only do you call you a dumb fool because a woman killed you, you were a coward and had your armor bearer stick a knife in you. You're dumb as a rock. That's how it ends. That's how the story of Gideon ends. When the Israelites saw that Ambelic was dead, they all went home. One dude. It's a picture of forthcoming things that we've seen. What did Hitler do? What did Pol Pot do? What did Stalin do? What did Lenin do? What are the leaders of caliphates doing right now? Just get a whole bunch of people just to follow, and the people then go, oh, man, what were we doing? I don't know what we were doing. I don't know. They just said to do it. They did it except for the ones that had their eyes on Jesus. God avenged the evil. Listen to this. What did he say? God's going to turn his ear from you. And he says, listen, God is our defense. And for you, those of you who don't, don't think that God is a warrior, that, you don't, that we're the kinder, friendlier people, you better rethink stuff. You've got to rethink it really well. I had this discussion this week with somebody we were talking about. I go, listen... In studies and stuff, I don't like to think about it. It's a good study, but I go, you know, I wouldn't want to be the dude that stuck the sword or the spear in Jesus' side. I realize that some people, Woody was there, and he goes, yeah, but it was merciful. I go, yeah, may have been, because he was up there hiding, but you want to be the one that stuck the spear in Jesus' side? Because if someone stuck a spear in your side, I'm going to guarantee you. I told Woody this. I guarantee you I will hunt them down, and it will not be a quick death. I will make them suffer for what they did to my family. And I think about our Lord, our God. He is just beautifully, just long-suffering and loving. But it, I sit there and I go, oh my gosh, like, those dudes that whipped Jesus, those soldiers that punched him in the face, put a crown of thorns, stuck them in there and laughed as they felt it rub against the skull. The dudes that drove the nails in, you think God's sitting up there and going, ah, easy day for them. Huh, huh, huh. When their day came, I bet you they're, listen. <laughs> we talked about it. God is a warrior. The Lord is a warrior. And Yahweh is his name. And we get to call him Papa. And because we get to call him Papa, never, ever, ever, those of you at home, forget he is a warrior. But your papa is a warrior. Listen to what he says. God avenged the evil. He didn't, he didn't, it's not the wrong he avenged. He avenges the evil. And Belak had done to his father. God viewed what his son did, what, Ambe, what Ambelic did, what Gideon's son did, as a direct, listen to this, you guys, you can't make this up as a direct assault on Gideon. You reject what is the blasphemy of the Spirit. It's not saying the Lord's name. It's rejecting. It's rejecting Jesus Christ. And God says, uh-uh, uh-uh, that's evil. That's evil to the core. Murdering his 70 brothers and God brought down on the heads of the men of Shechem all the evil that they had done. The curse of Jotham, son of Jeroboam. This prophetic word became the curse on mankind of, that, of those people at that time. Crazy. So we go through this like, it's like this, yay, 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 what? That's how it's been so far, right? The judges conquering, we yeah, we know what happened here. It's the warning in the middle of life. It says it's very easy to take your eyes off me and worship things, not me. So guys, with that, I mean, we're going to head on to chapter 10. and We'll do that next week, and it's going to be good. And we'll look at the minor. There's two guys that are coming up that they call her minor judges. I don't know if I want to call them minor judges, but us so-called students of the Bible have named these men of God and women of God minors and majors. It's like we couldn't even, man, they've forgotten more than we know. But anyhow, 
I love it. Guys, I love you guys. And I pray that the words here speak encouragement to you. That you, when you see this, that you're encouraged by it. And you see the stories of redemption within the stories. You see the story of Jesus in every story. There's a story of Jesus. And in that story of Jesus, you're in the story. You're in the story, like we saw last week. This week, you're in this story. You're in the story. You, you, some of you may be the hero, and you just don't know it yet. You may be the one that's going to drop the stone. Don't try to figure out on who to drop the stone. Just be ready to drop the stone. You may be the one that has to speak against evil from a public place. That's you. And some of you may be tempted to do it the easy way. But the easy way is not always the right way. And it can turn around and bite you. But it will pay you back worse than what you get. You know what I'm saying? So listen, man. We've been talking a lot about Jesus. I just love Jesus. I love him. Not worthy of him, but man, do I love him. I am grateful for the gift of salvation. I am grateful to have an advisor. I am grateful to have a family that prays. I am grateful to read words and be hanging out with all you guys. Dude, I am grateful. And all of this is because of what's coming up in a couple of weeks. The birth of Jesus Christ. Man, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. How about you guys? You grateful? You have something there that you need to do? Lisa's coming up here. She's the woman of many words. I actually have that in a prophetic report, that you are a woman of many words. Yes, you do. Uh-huh. Hey, you so you, thank you for confirming. You're How many times do you think he's going to take the mic from me? <laughs> Only if you speak blasphemy. <laughs> um, all right, we gave you guys the, the list, and I am so sorry. Uh, Please make sure on number two, our Christmas feast is on the 21st. All right, so number one, remember, ask the Lord for a family in need that you're going to bless. So figure out who that is, start praying for them. And then on the 17th, what, uh, Eric and Cindy and, and that, we're going to have a bunch of stuff over set up in the, in the dining hall, and you're going to be able to fill a box of items that will be able to bless that family. All right, and then... But in, as you're praying for them, ask the Lord, what can you add to the box? You know, it might be chicken, might be, I, I don't know, what, whatever that is. And then write an encouraging note to them. And then after the 17th, it's up to you. You get to go and deliver that blessing to that family. All right? Because um, we want to be generous like our Father is generous. And then our family feast, um, everything that I'm saying right here, we have sign-ups in the back. So if, if you guys can sign up on that today. But we're, as a family, our Christmas party is going to be a, a Christmas feast for Machaca Road families. So when we say family, we're talking about all of you here. You're, some of you are like, wow, they do a lot, just their little family. No, you are the family we're talking about. So our family here, this is what we're doing, okay? So that's going to be uh, December 21st. It's a Thursday night, and you can sign up to bring a side and or you can and you can also sign up to help lead an activity because we're going to have the feast, we're going to have the Christmas story, we're going to have amazing worship, but we also want to have fun activities for the families. So you can sign up for that. You can sign up for to bake three dozen cookies that we can deliver to our BDF soldiers that are going to be working on Christmas Day, um, and actually even even more of them as they protect our borders and protect our land. Uh, we'll give you the date to be able to drop those off. And then the number four is our Christmas service is Sunday morning, 1030, uh, December 24th. I have one announcement that's not on here because we wanted to make sure to confirm, but worship teams, we're, we're, we're looking at combining worship teams, so we're com- getting confirmation. But on New Year's Eve, we're going to be doing a worship night prayerfully if we can get the the worship teams to commit and we're going to go from about 10 p.m to 12 30 and we're going to bring in the new year uh and that please on the sign up uh for the feast also put on there like how many is in your family so we know because we know the road families but we need to know your family who's coming with you so that we can make sure we have enough food
Lord, we love you. <clears throat> Jesus, thank you for your mercy and grace. You are amazing. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out from the jungle.